So let's talk about some notation the book uses. I don't want to go into yet how to multiply matrices. We will get into that soon enough. <clears throat> but I just want to describe the notation the book uses. So in the book, the homogeneous system, so this is book notation. system they use the letters LS a comma B in parentheses and the way that you would normally write this that X right there is supposed to be a capital X not just a regular single variable X now in this form, A is the coefficient matrix. And B is the constant. I'm gonna write the constant vector, and I'll explain why very soon, and X that weird bold capital X is the vector containing the variable coordinates. Now I think I have to explain a little bit about matrix multiplication in order to describe why this makes sense. So who has not multiplied matrices or doesn't remember it? So if I say across down, you all will look at me with blank stares. So matrix multiplication So we'll just do a 2 by 2 times a 2 by 2 The way we multiply matrices, you go across the first one, down the second one. So what we're going to do is multiply row 1 by column 1 in the second matrix. Now I'm going to end up erasing these highlights. If you do want to write something down to denote what we're doing, what I recommend you use is a horizontal line in the first matrix and a vertical line in the second like that just so you can see rows in the first one and columns in the second one so it's really obvious when you look so we're going to multiply and here we're going to have a 2 by 2 matrix so we have 1 times 2 plus 2 times negative 2 all I did was I took the corresponding the first element in the first row and the first element in the first column of the second matrix, multiply them together. So I am going across the two, the row and the column that I highlighted and multiplying. That's all I'm doing here. And I'm going to do the same thing for row one, column two now. So we have one times one plus two times three. So right now, go and fill out the bottom two entries in this. So you're going to, both of these entries are going to use row two. So go row two, column one for the first, and then row two, column two for the last entry there. So write those two down. Hey, but one times two, is that supposed to be one times zero? On the first? That is supposed to be one times zero, yeah, absolutely. Hopefully that will make more sense.
any questions on this product right here? We can multiply matrices that uh, are square and have the same dimension. We can also multiply matrices that are not square and don't have the same dimension, but they need to have the same number of elements to match up. And if you look, that means the number of elements in each row of the first matrix has to be the same as the number of elements in each column of the second matrix. So if I write out uh, some dimensions, I'll do that in blue. These are both two by two, two by two. So it doesn't matter the order I wrote them in, but it always goes row by column, row by column. I just remember that with RC remote control. So rows, number rows first, number of columns second. It's a little bit weird because your first measurement is actually a vertical measurement, the number of rows, and your second measurement's a horizontal or a width. So it's a little weird, it kind of goes height, by width, but it, just remember RC, remote control, and it works. It turns out the inner dimensions have to be the same, so those two must match. If they don't match, then you're going to run out, you'll have extra numbers in one uh, matrix that won't match up with the numbers in the other matrix, and you can't multiply, so they must match. Now we're going to multiply two matrices, except the second matrix is a column matrix, also known as a vector. So let's write down the dimensions here. Just remember RC, remote control. So number of rows, number of columns. Write down the dimensions of each matrix down below here. So fill in these blanks. Number of rows, number of columns. So first one's obviously two by two, second one, two rows, one column, so it's two by one. So our inner dimensions match. When we multiply, we're going to get a matrix that has the outer dimensions. So the inner dimensions match. The outer dimensions are gonna be dimensions of your answer or of your product. So I'll just draw two arrows. Outer dimensions are the dimensions of the product. So we multiply this out, we're going to have a two by one matrix. So you saw how to multiply matrices. It's a little bit strange because your second matrix has one column, but it's actually less work. So go ahead and multiply this out and write down, you should get a two by one matrix. So your matrix you get, row one is x1 plus two x2, row two is three x1 plus four x2. So any questions about that product right there? So let's consider this linear system. So I'll write our coefficient matrix. Uh, what do I want to do first? I'll write out, <coughs> let A be, this will just be the coefficients without the constants. The matrix B is gonna be five, negative three. And the matrix X is going to be X1, X2.
Now fill in A, X, and B, and then do that multiplication. So I'll just fill in the A, one, two, three, four, X1, X2 equals five, negative three. We did the product on the left already. It's pretty easy to multiply X1 plus two X2. And row two is three X1 plus four X2. And right side is still five, negative three. So we have a matrix equals another matrix. So first of all, do they have the same dimension? Does it make sense to say these two matrices have the, at least the same structure, the same size? So they're each uh, two rows, one column. So they're the same dimension. What would it mean for two matrices to be equal? So they definitely need to be the same size. It doesn't make sense to say they're equal if they don't have the same number of elements. That would be kind of crazy. What other property would these matrices need to have if they were actually the same? Kind of. Don't think about a graph here. So how many non-matrix equations are we really looking at? Two. There's an upper one and a lower one. So we're really looking at two equations. Write down those two equations. Those two equations should look really familiar. That's the system we started with right there. So we can represent that linear system in matrix form with AX equals B. So we can represent that exact system in this matrix form AX equals B. So now we can get back to the notation the book is using. So I'm going to scroll up for a second. I'll go right back there. So to define this system, the, the actual variable matrix depends. It's really just x1, x2, x3, as many x's as you need in order to match the dimension of, so the dimension of your constant works out. Uh, you could also see the, let's see, it would be a number of, rows, no, the number of columns in the first matrix would be the same as the number of variables represented in that second matrix, but it's the correct uh, number of rows in order for this to actually work out. And the, so what that means that X is dependent on the size of A or the size of B. So to define this system, all you really need is A and B. X is just uh, a bunch of variables you're going to figure out later. So the system's really defined by A and B. So that's why in the book they use this notation. LS stands for linear system of the matrix A and the matrix B. So to define a linear system, you really only need these two pieces right here. You don't need the equal signs and all that stuff. So that's why we can define it just using A and B. So I will sometimes use book notation here and sometimes uh, use uh, other notation. So ready to talk about null space. that math LS A0. What does that mean? First of all, what does LS stand for? Linear system. Linear system. So matrix A, what does that zero mean? Not the so zero vector. So it's based on homogeneous systems, what we're looking at. It's equal to zero. 
So that's the definition right there. Definition of null space. Uh, so you could rewrite as a x equals zero. Make sure I like to go at least three times around zero to make sure if you go twice, sometimes it looks like a normal zero. Usually three times makes it not look like zero. In your book, they just use the bold typeface. So it just looks extra dark, uh, but we just have to re write over our letters multiple times to do that. Uh, this is, so the fast notation, they use a fancy cursive N. I'll do my best to rewrite their N. Kind of looks like that. Remember, it doesn't depend on the B matrix, so it's really defined just off A. So you could talk about null space of just A. There is no, no B here. So you could write null space of A is the same as a linear system of A comma zero. So you can write them either way. find the null space of a matrix. I'm probably not going to write my n that fancy. I'll just do that type of n right there. So find n of a where a is the matrix 2, negative 1, 7, negative 3, negative 8. Second row, 1, 0, 2, 4, 9. Third row, 2, 2, negative 2, negative 1, 8. You do not need to write out equations. You have your matrix. How do we solve a system using a matrix? What are the things we do? What do we call swap and the other two row operations? So perform row operations. So you want to get your zeros the best you can down there and there. And you won't be able to zero out the last two for sure. So do your best to get zeros in those triangles. And I'll give you three minutes to do that. So compare with your neighbor. See if you're on the right track. How many variables do we have? Four. Close. Less close. Five. five. <laughs> Why is it five? Oh. What's that last column? Is it constants? No. Well, the last column we see is our last variable there's an invisible zero constant column of zeros, okay? So if I was actually using the notation I did before, I think I just did a vertical bar on the right side to mean that, that those are all the zeros right there. So our matrix really ends with all zeros. So there's really five variables here, x1 through x5. Can't use x, y, z. subtraction.
<laughs> it's true for a lot of things. <laughs> It's plus two oh two. Yeah. Jesus. Right. Two R two. So zero. Twenty two thirty. Oh, that's way better. So if something a little strange is happening in this matrix because your third variable is going to be free. So I can't clear the third column no matter how hard I try. Uh, well, I might be able to, but it'll mess other things up. My fourth variable is going to be non-free, just the way that I showed you how to do this. So the fourth variable is, is going to be non-free. But what that means is you can clear out row four. So you can use that one that's going to lock down the fourth variable and clear out column four right there. So you can't clear column three, but you can clear column four. So make sure you clear column four. Thank you. 
Okay, any questions on row operations? So let's think about free variables. So right away you can tell third variable is free because it's not locked down. Fourth variable, however, is not free because it is locked down with a one. Fifth variable has to be free. So there's no number down here that would lock the fifth variable down. So we have two free variables. So that'll be x3. We'll let x3 equal t, x4 equal s, oh, x5 equal s. So once we have this, do your best now to turn this into a uh, solution that looks like x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and these should all have an expression on the right side. x5 is t, x3, oh, no, x3 is t, x5 is s. So figure out x1, x2, and x4. I think all of them will have either an S or some T's or possibly both S and T in them. And of course you can write out your equations. The first equation X1 plus 2X3 plus X5. What does this equal? Equals zero. So remember there's an invisible zero on the right which absolutely you could write your zeros on the right side if you really want to absolutely but just remember we and of course I stopped writing that vertical bar to indicate there were zeros so I'll fix that there's these invisible zeros on the right side so write down your other equations and then solve for x1 x2 and x4. When I'm writing these, I'm skipping the intermediate algebra step, probably because, well, mainly because I don't want to write them down, but I think you've done enough algebra. This is algebra one step that I'm skipping, but just solving for x1, x2, and x4. Those are the steps I skipped. So I showed you different ways to write this down. So I'm going to, sh when I solve questions now, write less final versions of the answer, because you've seen a lot of different versions. So we'll just go with the uh, 
uh, this version right here. So any questions on this, writing this down? What is the minimal the null space could ever be of a matrix? There's something that's always included in the null space. The origin. So the origin is always a solution. Well, I guess if I phrase it in the null space, is always in the null space. So a math way to write that. There's the origin is an element of null space of A. So that's always true. The origin is an element of so that weird epsilon character means is an element of and of course NA is null space of A. So what can you say about a homogeneous linear system and inconsistency? Is that possible? If you have a homogeneous linear system, can there be no solution? Nope. Remember, x can always be the zero factor or the origin. So you always get a solution to the homogeneous system. You may get other solutions. For example, we just saw there was two dimensions. So it was a plane going through the origin. So sometimes it's just the origin, sometimes it's the origin and a line going through, sometimes the origin and a plane going through it, sometimes an origin and a three-dimensional linear object going through it, sometimes higher dimensions. But it's always going to include the origin. Now we're going to look at singular well, non-singular matrices. So we'll start with definition of a square matrices. So a square matrix is one that didn't party in college. No, I'm kidding. A square matrix is, I just talked about rows and columns, so same number rows as columns. A matrix with the same number of rows as columns. So they will always have the form n by n where your rows and column values always the same. So it would be an n by n matrix. And now we can talk about a non-singular matrix. So the square matrix is So A is non-singular if it has only the trivial solution. So a matrix is singular, a square matrix is singular if NA equals zero. Oh, that's exactly incorrect is non-singular and a square matrix 
is singular if and a has free variables is one way to think of it or has anything in addition to the origin. So I'll write this as NA contains anything in addition to the origin. Now, when you read, when you see the definition here, it looks a little strange because we're calling a matrix non-singular if it has a single solution and singular if it has multiple solutions. That shouldn't make any sense the way it's written out right here, which is why I had to read it twice and I'm actually gonna read it a third time to make sure I wrote these down right. So A is non-singular if it has only the trivial solution. Non-singular if it has only that, okay. Uh, another way to think about this, as we'll look later, is uh, non-singular means you can invert it. So it sort of has this inverse pair that exists. So uh, singular means there is no other inverse. There is no way to undo it. So it's kind of a one-way uh, linear transformation, another word that I won't tell you until later on. But basically, there's no way to undo singular. But non-singular, there's a way to come back from that. Uh, but like I said, when you just read it in this, with this definition, it looks very backwards. So again, non-singular means there's one solution. Singular means there's lots of solutions to the null space. Did I talk about cheat sheets in this class yet? All right, so you get a cheat sheet in linear algebra. So if you took calculus two or three, you got a cheat sheet in those classes. You get a cheat sheet in linear algebra. Of course, what that really means is there's a lot of things you have to remember. So as you're seeing, there's definitions going by that are not intuitive, that are not easy to remember. So definitions are a really important part of your cheat sheet in linear algebra. Unless you have a really good memory for definitions, most likely definitions are gonna be trouble. So here's one definition that's super tricky right here. Null space, I would say, is not the trickiest definition but this is way more tricky. I had to read it three times to get it right. So any time that I have to do that, there's a good chance you'll have to read it more than once in order to get it right. Uh, so definitions I recommend should take up probably a quarter of your cheat sheet, like a good part of your cheat sheet should be definitions. Uh, null space is a great one uh, to put up there. You can write, of course, some row operations if you forgot those. You can put example problem the very beginning of the quarter. There's not many types of questions I can ask you. You could probably put four example problems on your cheat sheet that cover most of the types of questions I would ask you so far. By the time your final exam comes around, there's gonna be so much definitions and other things and theorems on your cheat sheet that you probably won't have much room for examples. Maybe you can squeeze on a couple. Uh, but for now, definitions should all be on your cheat sheets. So there is the square matrix that's in here that's pretty important. If a matrix is not square, you can't say that it's singular or not singular. So it's not applicable to talk about it being singular. So a non, non-square, maybe oblong or something, but a non-square matrix is neither singular nor non-singular. <laughs> so here's a theorem. A non-singular uh, matrix row reduces, oh, I should write down the identity first before I refer to it. So identity matrix 
we're going to use I sub N, so capital I sub N. And this matrix right here has ones down the diagonal. I don't know how many ones, so that's why we use dot, dot, dot to just say repeat the pattern. And then it will have zeros off of the diagonal. And the N stands for the dimensions. So the dimensions of this matrix are n by n. So n rows and columns. Of course, if you don't have the same dimensions, your diagonal won't end in the bottom right corner. If you have more rows, if you have way too many rows, you, you're, you'll have a bunch of zeros down below if you have too many rows, so your diagonal won't hit the corner. And if you have too many columns, your diagonal will hit the ground before it hits the right edge. So that's the identity matrix. It has some other neat properties we'll get into when we look more at multiplication. Uh, I'll just write, without going into detail, how multiplication looks with the identity matrix. So it acts like one when it comes to multiplication. It's what we call the multiplicative identity. not the zero matrix. The zero matrix would be the additive identity. Just like zero, you add, doesn't change. One, when you multiply, doesn't change. Uh, <coughs> so that's our identity matrix. Now we can write the theorem. I'll write the abbreviation NMRRI. So this is non-singular matrices row reduce to the identity. So if you have a non-singular matrix, meaning it has exactly one solution, uh, the null space has one solution, then it will row reduce the identity. So it will look like the identity matrix after we're done with our row operations. So let's go back and look at the example. Well, the example I, we did last was not a square matrix, so that wouldn't make, that wouldn't fit in here at all. It's the identity. Following are illegible. The following are equivalent. A is non singular. What else can you tell me about A, the matrix A, if I only told you A is non singular? Well, in this class, you can tell me it's a ma it's a it's a matrix. So the solution, but what can you tell me about the actual matrix A? Don't worry about the solution itself. It's got to be a square matrix. So just right there, A has to be square. So A is non-singular. That is equivalent to uh, A row reduces. Another equivalent, the null space of A is exactly the zero vector. If we look at the linear system of A and any B, it has a unique solution for each B, meaning there will be exactly one uh, point. There won't be any free variables no matter what uh, matrix or what vector B that you use. So there will be exactly one solution, which again probably makes the choice of calling this non-singular even more confusing. 
So the non-singular matrix has a unique solution for each B. All right, and we're out of that chapter. So that was chapter one. So we're gonna be jumping into chapter two. Actually, we'll be jumping in chapter two tomorrow. That's a perfect place to end. Uh, so this quarter, I am gonna cut off your discussions after the last homework for that chapter is due. So your homeworks will, the discussions will have dates on them and I, you can contribute to them afterwards, but I will have already graded them at that point. So you can add more replies and questions, but your grade will already be uh, finished by then for that discussion section.